Welcome everyone um, to a Refuge Point Voices from the Field session. I'm Sasha Chanoff, I'm the CEO of Refuge Point, and it is so wonderful to have you all here. I know that many board members and close friends are here with us today, so it's, it's really great to have you. This Voices from the Field session is something we've actually been doing for some time now, where we bring the people who are on the front lines with Refuge Point, as well as those we're serving and others together for discussions so we can convey something of what we do to you. And today we have a really special Voices from the Field session. It's about the Sponsor Circle program for Afghans. Uh, this is a new program that Refuge Point has been helping to build along with a number of other partners to expand resettlement capacity for Afghans who were evacuated into the US in August. Um, and about 75,000 Afghans were evacuated into the country and started resettling through agencies across the country. But, uh, but we did not have as, um, as a resettlement system the capacity to welcome all those people. So as an emergency effort, the US launched the Sponsor Circle Program for Afghans, which enables Americans to group together in groups of five or more and directly sponsor a family. And this program is something that Refuge Point has been helping to build. So to start today, we have a really special session. We have Mohammed Mahamadi. Mohammed is wonderful to have you here. Uh, he is he is has been resettled to Connecticut thanks to Jerry and Eileen Monahan, who are here with us today as well. And we have Doreen Kutanili, who's our uh, sponsor program coordinator. So we're gonna have a discussion amongst us, but first I wanted to give you a little presentation just to let you know more about this program. And so I'm going to share my screen in a moment. One, give me a second here. share my screen and okay i hope you can all see my screen doreen can you see my screen great so i just wanted to give you a sense of refuge point broadly which is that we're an organization that advances solutions for refugees in life-threatening situations and one of our primary ways of doing that is to identify people around the world across africa the middle east and in other countries around the world and help them resettle to the us canada australia and other countries where they can rebuild their lives safely we started doing that some time ago and we've grown and grown so we now have staff um, as you can see on the screen in a lot of different countries around the world on the front lines identifying people who need to reunite with family who can't stay safely in the countries to which they fled and who need resettlement as a life saving solution. As we've built our staff and our efforts to do this, we've had a lot of opportunities to expand into other relocation pathways. That is helping people through other means um, in addition to resettlement reunite with family or get to other countries and when the us launched this emergency program um, with a number of partners including the community sponsorship hub which was a lead organization helping to coordinate efforts to build the sponsor circle program for afghans uh, we were turned to refuge point was turned to because of our expertise identifying people overseas and we were asked to hire a team to send to military bases in the US to help interview people, um, to get them to opt into the program or explain what this program was. And so that's how we started in this last year. The Sponsor Circle program is really distinct in that it enables Americans to come together and sponsor a family independent of resettlement agencies. But those Americans have to go through a lot of steps in order to do that. One of those steps is putting together a resettlement plan. This is a resettlement, um, this is a, a grid that came from, an, from another sponsor circle from Walnut Creek, California. And if you are on the line here, I'm grateful to the sponsor circle there for this grid. It just shows all the different things that Americans have to put together in terms of a plan to welcome um, an Afghan individual or a family. 
So you can see all the different steps that people have to take. And what we've often found is that the sponsor circles that come together reach out to a broader community and engage a lot of people to help in this process. As we started this program, the sponsor circles started forming in a lot of different states. So right here, you can see in green the states where circles have formed. This is expanding every day as more people sign up to create sponsor circles. And there's been a lot of attention on this program as well because it's a unique new program in American history. The Today Show did a really compelling piece about one of the first sponsor circles, which was formed in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and, and so if you look online, you can see a lot of different news and media around it. And Refuge Point has been featured in some of that as well. So that's what I wanted to show you. And now, we're going to get into the discussion and I wanted to turn first to you Doreen as the individual who's helped to build this program on behalf of Refuge Point to ask you as you started on military bases in the US what was that like um, tell us a little about how things started and what the utility of the sponsor circle program was um, well Sasha I'm not sure who actually coined this this kind of phrase but I think um, somebody used the analogy that it was as if we were building a plane while flying it. And I think that's that's really apt. Um, you know, from the start, like we all, there was just so much to do and we were trying to move forward, but we were also trying to like build, you know, infrastructure for this, this program um, and stand it up really quickly uh, from something that just didn't exist. And so from everything, from trying to figure out how to put new, um, new um, information into a database to creating new forms from um, just getting permission, um, you know, for being on a military base and, you know, figuring out logistics of just how to get guests, you know, from their barracks to our interview space and, you know, wondering how everyone is going to view this program, you know, how resettlement agencies are going to view it, how are the American people going to view it, how are the guests going to view it. Um, there was just a lot to do. It was pretty overwhelming. Um, but I think the main um, the main sentiments that that I felt was both kind of it, it teetered between excitement, you know, and fear. Um, excitement for all of the newness, excitement for all of the possibilities um, for resettlement in this country, for the Afghans who were we were going to help through the program. Um, but just, you know, fear of like, are we really going to be able to do this? Um, and how is this going to be received by, you know, the wider, the wider community? Great. Thanks. And can, and Doreen, it's great to have you here. I know you worked for Refuge Point before in a number of different places around the world. And when we kind of on a emergency basis, were looking for someone, you raised your hand and said, I'm available. And we were so fortunate that you were able to do that and that you've been such a leader in helping to build this program. Can you describe, there's a lot of different pieces of this program. Can you describe Refuge Point's distinct role? Sure. Um, we are responsible, we, we often say we're responsible for the smallest, but the most important part, um, because we are the guest facing uh, part of the program. So we are the ones that present the program to the guests at the safe havens. And then we are the ones that, um, get their consent to opt into the program. Um, the way that all of the resettlement is done traditionally through the resettlement agencies is through a program called the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program. All refugees and are entitled to that program. And so our program is something that they have to opt into through a process of informed consent. And that is what we guide them through is that process. We explain the program, we explain their options, and then we ask them if they feel like this program is a good fit for them. And then if it is, we get them to sign some forms that um, acknowledge that they are choosing to opt into this program um, and then uh, we give them their placement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've interviewed people, gotten to know them, and then you see them off? Well, we, we, you know, we get to know them a little bit. I mean, I was actually lucky enough to get to interview Mohammed. Um, but, and we, we do sometimes see people off. We don't always, because a lot of the departures happen at odd hours of the day, but we have been able to see some refugees off. Yeah, no, I know. I was I was asking because I remember when you sent uh, some photos of one of the first departures. And I remember when I visited Fort McCoy, too, and you were there and introduced us to a family that went to uh, Walnut Creek in California. And it was um, it was really exciting to meet them there at Fort McCoy and then to see them some months later with their sponsor circle in, in um, Walnut Creek. So that's um, that's wonderful. Thank you. What what has been? What do you think some of the value of the program has been for Afghans who've gone into it? 
Well, I, I mean, I think probably Mohammed could speak better to that, but I mean, from my perspective, and I will just insert that my very first experience working with any refugee family was actually here in the United States. I was living in Burlington, Vermont, and I volunteered with the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. As a group of volunteers, we were five volunteers that we were assigned to a family that had been recently uh, resettled from, um, from Kenya, actually, from, I, I think it was either from Dadaab or, or Kakuma. And so, you know, our role was to help provide support to this family. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, fast forward to last October, when we heard about this program, I was so excited about it. Um, and getting back to your question, the reason, the value is, I just think it's so important um, and I'm again uh, based on my own experience I think it's so important when somebody is new to this country to actually have a group of people kind of uh, focused on that individual or on that family because as you showed in the slide before there are so many things that have to happen for this family that's been resettled to the United States that for that just to be fall on the shoulders of one person or one caseworker is a lot. And um, I know that I think, you know, the volunteer group I was part of, you know, many, many years ago, I think we made a lot of difference in the life um, of the family that had just resettled. And so uh, that's what I think is one of the, the strengths of the program is just having that support. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a necessary support that anybody who's recently arrived would need. And I know we've also seen in some cases that there have been family members who were evacuated from Kabul to bases in the U.S. who had other family members or friends in the U.S. in certain places, and yet the resettlement agencies um, that have done a heroic job, by the way, of, of increasing their staffing on like an emergency basis and doubling and tripling staffing levels so that they could help to receive all the Afghans coming in. But in some cases, resettlement agencies didn't have the capacity to bring a family member to reunite with other family. Like I'm thinking of um, a case in Seattle, Washington, where that happened, where there was a nephew um, who wanted to go with his uncle there, but there was no resettlement capacity there. And so a sponsor circle formed around that uncle who was then able to bring the nephew to him. Have you seen other cases like that? Um, well, we've seen a number of cases of people who um, either they had met a family through volunteering at one of the bases, or even just that they, they got to know um, of a family because of an Afghan family who was resettled to their, their area. I actually think, if I'm not mistaken, the case of the Walnut Creek um, sponsor circle, I think the re how they, they, they learned about the family that they ended up sponsoring, and they did name that family individually, was because of another Afghan family that had resettled in their area that was acquainted with the family that the Walnut Creek family supported. And so that's, that was something that, especially in um, phase one of the um, of Operation Allies Welcome, that was something that we were able to do um, a lot more frequently, is just uh, match people who um, were being sponsored, but like a sponsor circle was, was sponsoring a specific family from one of the bases. Right. And lastly, Doreen, and then I want to turn to Mohammed. Um, I'm eager to turn to you, Mohammed. We have now successfully helped, we meaning the U.S. Um, and the resettlement agencies and Americans who've gotten involved have helped 75,000 Afghans off of those eight military bases which are closed, but now we're in phase two of Operation Allies Welcome. And phase two is evacuating additional people in from lily pads overseas to um, to Leesburg, Virginia, where they're being processed and then going from there. And you're in Leesburg, Virginia now working on that. What's that been like? Um, well, it's been really interesting. I mean, I think we all learned, I think everybody that's involved in the operation acknowledges that we learned a lot from phase one. So I think for phase two, things are actually running a lot more smoothly in, in many ways. Um, we're also dealing with a lot, a population that's a lot smaller. Um, the maximum population at the facility is a thousand people. And so um, at many of the military bases, and you know, again, Mohammed could speak to this, but there were thousands of, of and thousands of people. Um, but I think, you know, for me, one of the most uh, gratifying aspects of, of this is just uh, having been able to witness one of the arrivals of the of the flights. Um, and that was just really special Watch, watching everybody walk in, you know, people were holding American flags and giving them to, to the guests as they entered the um, 
the uh, the facility. Um, there were people, you know, we were all cheering. Some of the guests uh, were quite uncomfortable, kind of, you know, they put their head down and just like, you know, walked really quickly. Others were kind of like rock stars and, you know, they were kind of like doing fist bumps and, you know, clasping their hands, like just in gratitude. And mm -hmm. I think for everyone, it was just a really special, special experience. And their flights now coming in from Doha, among other places. And I think that flight you were referring to was one of the first flights in phase two. Yeah, I believe it was from Doha. And we are receiving flights almost every week. Wow, great. Thank you, Doreen. And Mohammed, I want to turn to you now. It, it is great to meet you. How are you? Good. Thank you for your kind invitation for us and uh, to come to your and spend some time with you today. Yeah, thanks. And and we have a lot of people um, um, watching in what watching today, and and Including they were eager to my parents. I think my parents are already watching us. Your parents are here with us as well. Yep. And they're uh, they're in where are they now? They are in Afghanistan. Kabul. They're in Afghanistan. Yep. Um, well, I want to say hello to your parents. I have had a chance. Um, <laughs> Just to say, I've had a chance to meet Muhammad and also to meet um, Jerry and Eileen, who are the leaders in the sponsor circle caring for him. And as, as you'll see, um, he's in a really great place. Uh, and he's a great guy. And he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. so, Muhammad, would you, um, if you don't mind, I'd love to just hear a little about, so you're from, tell us where you're from, and what the circumstances were that led you to getting to the um, airport? Okay. Uh, in Kabul. Uh, you mean, uh, okay. Uh, we were leaving Kabul uh, in last August in 2021. And no one can image that Kabul will fall to the Taliban. And uh, even the Taliban, they were surpri surprised at how fast they, they advanced in Afghanistan. and. Uh, after that, when Kabul fell, uh, everyone was shocked, including me. And uh, at that night, I invite my friends to house to to have some video games and to playing. And we was uh, playing game till the morning. And uh, after that, uh, uh, my friends go back to his house, and uh, he just called me then that my family go to Canada, and there was a U.S. military start flights from the midnight of August 15, at the day that Kabul fell to the uh, Taliban. And the evacuation of uh, American citizens and other people from Afghanistan that they work with Americans, uh, it has start from August 15, and uh, it has ended by, by 13 August, the midnight of 30 August. Um, uh, the, the last troop of American that they evacuate from Afghanistan. And uh, mm -hmm. um, on the, the first night that Kabul fall, and I, I talked with my cousins and, and have a plan to go to airport and try to get out from the country. And uh, we tried a lot, but uh, we can't. Uh, on 22nd August, we tried one more, and my cousin, uh, he was at the airport with his sibling and my grandma. Um, uh, and my dad told me, pack your baggage and I take some of my documentation and just two pair of clothes and uh, we head to the airport. It was only 45 minutes to the airport, but we arrived there to take almost uh, four hours to, uh, to get to the airport. And uh, uh, my cousin that uh, I was with him and uh, one of my uncle, but, uh, he is right now in Alexandria, and uh -huh. uh, my cousin is in Lenox, Massachusetts, and 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 he is also my childhood friend. Uh, we get into the airport, uh, but my parents can't, uh, and we get out from the country. We still remain when we get into the airport two days at the airport, and uh, uh, my parents was uh, supposed to leave a day after us, but uh, after the bombing, there was a suicide bombing in the heavy gate. Uh, there's a, a gate in Kabul airport. And after that, uh, they don't allow people to, to more to get out from the country. And uh, 
So sorry, just to can so you you say you got to the airport, you were there in Kabul at the airport waiting for your parents, but then there was the suicide bombing in the airport, yeah, and, I, and your parents weren't able to get in. Yeah, I leave Kabul, and my parents were supposed to leave a day after me. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, after the bombing in Kabul, uh, they can't get out, and my dad uh, decided to don't take risk of death in airport, and he decided to stay at home. Mm-hmm. And and how many um, siblings do you have? You're the oldest. Yeah, I'm you... the oldest, and I have five siblings and my parents. And your parents and your mom and dad are here with us today, listening. Yeah, they're listening to us. Okay. All right. How how old are your siblings? Um, I am the oldest. I'm 20, and my sibling is 18, 15, 11, 9, and 6. Wow. Wow. And what was it? So then you flew and ar- arrived in Fort Pickett? No. At first, uh, we go to uh, Kuwait. Uh, it's an Arabic country, and we go there for some background check and some stuff to, that uh, it was linked to the Department of Defense, and uh, we have uh, some background checks at there. And after that, we fly to Dallas in DC. Um, and after that, uh, I was in Fort Pickett, Northern Virginia, almost five months. For so, okay, so you were in Fort Pickett, Northern Virginia, for five months waiting there. And I think this was like broadly, this was one of the challenges that happened in America when seventy-five thousand people were evacuated in the resettlement agencies that are supposed to help. Um, in the previous U.S. administration, very few refugees actually came here. And so those resettlement agencies that are supposed to help, they had to um, reduce their staff and close many offices. So when 75,000 people arrived, you among others in in Fort Pickett and in other military bases, the U.S. just didn't have the capacity, the resettlement capacity. So you were there for five months. What was that like being in Fort Pickett for five months? uh, being bored and doing nothing. It, um, <laughs> <laughs> Did were, were you able to? Were you in touch with your parents while you were there? Uh, yeah, I was in touch with them. Okay, and and um, and and you're in touch with them often, right? Yeah, every day. Every day, every day. And I, and I read that beautiful article about you in the Christian Science Monitor, and it said that you were cooking and you were calling your mom for some recipes or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what happened then when you left Fort Pickett? Tell, tell us about when you went and met Jerry and Eileen. Um, right. Uh, one day I go, um, before I go to, I have fly to Connecticut. I don't know them, that there is a, a Jerry and Eileen that they will, and where I'm going. And I have no idea about that. And I just got an email from Jerry that he sent that, uh, a picture of uh, his own and with, with Eileen. And, uh, uh, I, and there was a saying that about, uh, we're going to meet you tomorrow and we will pick you up in baggage claim. And uh, I met them in airport. And after that, yeah, I'm here. Wow. And and so you met them at the airport and then they brought you back to their house. Where do you live now? Yeah, I'm in, up, in downstairs and they're in upstairs. You're downstairs and they're upstairs. Okay, <laughs> great. And and so what do you, um, what are your plans here in the US? What's it been like? You've been there now for about two months. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and- I've done a lot of things since I have in Connecticut. Uh, that I want, I, I have listed today. Um, I, I arrived here in 28 January, the end of January. And the first thing that I did in here, uh, I get a library card and join military book club. You got a library card and what, joined the military book club? Yeah, military book club. And uh-huh. after that, I get the gym membership. Uh-huh, a gym membership? Gym membership, yeah. Uh, and got, got the two courses. Uh, it's a type of coding, Python, and vocabulary for English. And it's online. You started taking coding and English courses online? Yeah, it's online. Uh huh. Great. Mm, I got my driving permit. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did you get your driver's permit? Last week. Last week. Congratulations. Thank you That's- so much. 
And he's totally frustrated because he thought that he just, once he got the permit, he could drive. Uh-huh. Yes. He didn't realize he had to have one of us or a licensed driver with him. For three months, so he can't drive by himself until July. So and we also have to explain to him that driving in the United States is quite different from driving in Kabul. And, uh -huh. you know. That moving stop. violations would not sit well no. with his asylum claim. And a stop sign is a stop, stop <laughs> sign. Uh-huh. We're working on that. He's, get, he's getting good uh -huh. at U.S. driving. Uh-huh. And, and Mohammed, so what are your future plans? Yeah, I, I don't finish. I, I want to talk about all of them. And uh, right now I'm translating for the two Afghan families that they have arrived to our eyes. And uh, I'm translating for the Ford family that they are now in New Milford. So sorry, to, uh, um, the RAs are the resettlement agencies. So two yeah. other families are near you and they've been resettled through resettlement agencies yeah. and you're helping to translate for them? Yeah, I'm translating for them. Uh-huh, And Great. And I'm already working for improve my writing skills. Uh, and we did a lot of fun too. Uh, uh, last month, uh, uh, I was in Vermont doing Iski uh, with Gerard and Eileen. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> where where were you skiing? Vermont. Great. Which ski resort? Smuggler's uh, Notch. Smuggler's Notch. Yeah. Uh -huh. Time was that, was that the first time you've ever been skiing? Yeah, it was my first time. <laughs> How was it? <laughs> I fell a lot and it was good. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I do biking for fun and playing soccer, uh, playing some video games and uh, beating someone in Rummy Cube. <laughs> <laughs> frequently. Yeah, frequently, way too often. Yeah. He also whipped my butt in chess. Yes. <laughs> Oh, you're a chess player too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, and and so, Mohammed, I know that you studied in college a little bit for a few months yeah, for before a few months. before you had to leave, and you're here. Are you planning to study in college here? Yeah, my, my plans for future is uh, actually to join Western Connecticut State University uh, and uh, to ha have a bank, uh, have a job in a bank, and that I have already applied for it. Uh, mm -hmm. like a month ago and maybe in next week I have an interview with the bank uh, and pr mm, procedure asylum to, to run my asylum and to get my citizenship in here that's mm -hmm. my future plan mm -hmm. and uh, working to get a SIV visa to my parents the special immigrant visa mm -hmm. and to get them here in Connecticut Great. Um, yeah. It's, and tell them where you want your masters from. That was the third or fourth thing we heard from you. Yeah. And I will get my, I want to get my uh, MBA from Harvard University. <laughs> That's a good place. Yeah. And there's <laughs> one, one problem. You don't have a bachelor's yet, but we'll work on that. <laughs> work on that. So, mm hmm so, 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 Mohammed, let me turn to, um, to Jerry and Eileen, you two, um, Tell, tell, like, tell us, first of all, how did you hear about the Sponsor Circle program? Oh, it's, oh, back it was this. very <laughs> circuitous. We, we work with IRIS, which is a resettlement agency in Connecticut, and, and emails were flying around, and someone said, uh, I know this um, woman, and she took one of uh, Mohammed's cousin, and they're in Pennsylvania, and he's, he's a very nice young man, uh, Mahir, and he has a cousin that's stuck at uh, Fort Pickett. And we went, oh, OK, well, we can do that. Uh, um, Gerard has background in after Vietnam. He and his family took in a Cambodian family. And, and I've been with Iris in New Milford for uh, this is our third settlement of a family. We've been since 2016. We've settled three families in, in New Milford. So we're kind of into that. And we said, you know. This young man looks very nice. We didn't tell him until we were pretty sure we got him because we didn't want to raise his hopes. And we were interviewed and we talked to Mahir and Mahir said uh, he was a very nice young man and Mahir was correct. And so, Mahir said his English isn't that good. Yeah, that good. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. He said my so, English is better than Muhammad's, but nonetheless, we, that would 
when we heard him talking, we go, Jima here, he's awfully good. Yeah, Eileen is also a literacy volunteer and she was all prepared yeah, to do uh, assessment tests and everything else. And he no. walked in and we said, no. Nah. No, he doesn't need assessment <laughs> tests. We, we do yeah. some few things on the pronunciation and, and that. Finessing pronunciation yeah. and finessing grammar. Yeah. But so did, did you have to, you had to fill out that resettlement plan? Oh, oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, go, and did you, did you also bring you, I know with sponsor circles, you need five people right. and you two are obviously the leads on this, but you brought some other people in the community ar around to support you. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice people. Uh, knowing his background, uh, we have a retired banker on our, in our circle and then we had a doctor, which we thought would be good for the medical and then an executive at uh, General Electric and she put together a fabulous resume for Mohammed. You just read the resume and you want to hire him. He's just, it's a very well, good resume. You talk to him and you want to hire him too. I yeah. know. Yeah. Because he's got a lot of background. He did, he did the books at his father's school for two years. So he, he's very into accounting and uh, we thought we'd started a bank teller job. And oh, uh, we're working that's on great. that. Let me just go back, Mohammed. Um, so your dad, runs a school in Kabul? Uh, a private school in Kabul. A private school that's, a, is it, you said K through eight? Yeah. Okay. I, and you worked at that school? Yeah, I was working at that school. You were working at the school. Okay, great. And, and, and Jerry and Eileen, you had to, as, as part of Sponsor Circle, you have to raise money too. So mm -hmm. how did that go? Unbelievably fabulous. I just I told a friend of mine and she was, comfortably set how much we needed to get two thousand two hundred and seventy five dollars yep. just to start the process she came in the next day with a banker's check for that much money mm. so we had him started and then we went out <laughs> if you know the monahans the friends of the monahans you got a letter from us we sent basically our christmas card christmas list card and uh, we sent out 99 letters and we uh all together made over six thousand dollars to start him up and and uh We've done other things, local publicity. We've gotten more money, so we're kind of putting that aside for a car. So, because between New Milford and Westcon, where he wants to go to school, it's it's a trip. So, it will work much better if he has a car and that driver's license, which will come in July. Mm -hmm. Is he driving your car now? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. And it's still in one piece. Yes. <laughs> and. Uh, so how many people do you think have either heard about this or have joined you to um, help support Muhammad? Oh, a couple did, hundred. Yeah. Well, uh, besides whoever saw the article in Christian Science Monitor or the local, Our local media. local paper, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our local paper did a cover story and the next day, uh, the same day, same day went out. A gentleman put $2,000 in his bank account. Oh, mm. just yeah, yeah, so it's been, very good, and uh, we've got him all his services. He's got the dental and the health and the psychological and the food stamps and all those things. It, it's been a slog, no, and no. Mohammed was bored because this has been two months where nothing was happening except all the stuff was happening in the background, and it's now all starting to come together. We found a Masaka club and a couple other uh, young men his age in, in Danbury where, he, you know, oh. he's meeting with them. So he, he had spent a lot of time to talking to people with a lot of gray hair. So can you find <laughs> a 20 year olds? What if you find a 20 year old Afghan, you know, so we found some in Danbury. So hopefully they'll get together soon. That That's great. So Mohammed, you started playing soccer? Yeah, I'm playing soccer. How, what position do you play? Forward. Forward? Yeah. Left, right. forward. left forward. Are you lefty? No, I'm right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, Jerry and Eileen and Mohammed, you know, one thing that strikes me, and I think one of the things that has been really profound and important about the Sponsor Circle program is the, the amount of people that you have brought together to support Mohammed in one way or another, and the people who know about it. And I've seen that in other sponsor circles. And I think that's a really distinct part of this program is that there's so many people who are coming here. Um, and when I remember talking a number of years ago to 
a refugee who was a, a, a successful businessman and a millionaire. And he said to me, and he had come from Vietnam many years earlier, and he said, refugees, when they first arrive here, need, um, need seven volunteers at least, one for every day of the week. But it feels... <laughs> It feels like with what you've you've done in the community you've brought around you, you really have all the support you need. Do you feel that that's the case? Yes. Yeah. The point I want to make is that we only have five in our circle of support, but then we have all our friends who come in, and if we had to take them someplace, they they brought them meals, they've taken care of them, they brought them clothes, you know. So the circle of support can be small, but then all the people know about them, and and they just come stand up and help us. So the starter circle of support is, doesn't need a big group. You only need the five and do the plan. And then you go and then people help you. So what was it like at the airport when you went to get Muhammad? You said he'd been traveling for a while. Muhammad, you were tired? Yeah, well, my husband, was, Jerry was parked in the car. So it was just me. And what was I wearing? Do you remember? You told me you remembered what I was wearing. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> An Irish fisherman sweater. And I just said I had red hair and, and saw the picture. So there's this one young man left in baggage claim and uh, that must be Mohammed. And, it was. <laughs> and so I greeted him. Jerry went and got the car and he was up for since 2 a.m. flying. And uh, first meal is supposed to be culturally correct meal that he gets in the country and i had uh, an afghan beef stew in the crock pot for when he got home got yeah. to our house but, but he was starving so we took him to mcdonald's <laughs> his first meal uh -huh. was in McDonald's. <laughs> so and, and you know went from there the next morning that night he says to me uh, the bus he says i'll cook you breakfast tomorrow morning i'll cook you afghan eggs and we went okay you're he, a keeper you could stay yeah, yeah. <laughs> You didn't cook at home, did you? You didn't cook much at home at all. No, I didn't. No, and Gerard loves to cook, and the two have been bonding over Afghan mm. recipes, and we had people, and we had our circle of supporters in for, uh, uh, what's it, Palau? Palau, yeah. The national dish, dish of Afghanistan, and mom's on the phone telling us how to make it. And so just so have, have, have you met Mohammed's parents? Just, just via WhatsApp. Yeah, just to, uh, on the phone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, so what else about the Sponsor Circle program? Like, what has anything else struck you? I know that you've taken in other people and families before. Um, what is what is this meant for you? What does it mean? Yeah, it's we have space. We the space he's in used to be our Airbnb, and we closed that down. So we had the space. We've had done this before and it's changing life. And fortunately, very luckily, we got this young man who's going to go places and he's gonna go places. He's gonna get his family here and they're just gonna be US citizens that will make us all proud that we're got them here and they're part of our country now. And I've always believed that this country should welcome with open arms, those who get out in the first wave, because they're the ones who have the smarts, the wherewithal, and the guts to get out. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones who make a difference in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having having been having been in this space for a really long time now, almost thirty years, I can say um, that people make extraordinary contributions and are just like you and me become us become part of the fabric of american society contribute mm -hmm. to our communities in untold ways and that's what you're saying mm -hmm. absolutely yeah culturally, hey, wanna... culturally and economically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's right yeah there was actually an interesting study in the last administration um that showed that people who came here as refugees contributed I think it was $63 billion more to the economy than they took in services over 10 years. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not often known. Um, I was just in Canada uh, the, a few weeks ago and, and I was talking to the Minister of Immigration and 85,000 Syrians have come to Canada since 2015. And those people are also contributing in enormous ways, just like the, 
um, Mohammed and the 75,000 Afghans who have recently come here and more who are on their way will as well. Hey, I want to invite people, if, you're, if you'd like, you can pose a question um, in the chat. There are the, there's, a, there's a Q&A, so you're welcome to pose questions if you'd like. Asha, there is one question in there. Um, if you'd like, I can, it's related to the NCC, so it might be best for me to answer that. Do you want me to read the question and then go ahead and answer? Yeah, that's strange. I can't see the questions, um, but Doreen, please, why don't you be the facilitator for the chat? Okay, great. Oh, so I see it. Some, yeah. Do you see it now? Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want me to go ahead and, and do that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the question in the chat is, um, if I understand phase two correctly, from what you said, only a thousand refugees are coming at a time to Leesburg. Do they need to be cleared before the next wave of a thousand arrive? How many total are expected to come overall in phase two and over how long a period of time? And yeah. then a second question is, is Refuge Point involved at all in helping refugees who are here to get family members who are, who are at risk out of Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start with the with the Leesburg questions. Um, it's not a thousand people at a time. They're actually um, because we receive flights each week. Some weeks we only get like 100, 150 people. Some weeks we get 300 people um, and some weeks we don't get any arrivals at all. Um, as we're getting arrivals, we're also departing people um, at this point. Uh, the, the goal at Leesburg is to depart people within 30 days. So unlike the experience Mohammed had at Fort Pickett for, for quite a number of months, um, at Leesburg, they really are trying to um, do a very quick turnaround in processing. And we have, um, I think thus far, we started in, in early March. So we have, I think the first group of people who arrived, I think most of those people have, have departed within 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, and Doreen, just to clarify also that uh, the majority of these people are going through what's the kind of more traditional resettlement process. But, but many of them are also going through sponsor circles. And some of the first people to come to Leesburg uh, departed through sponsor circles that had been formed. Yes, no, that is correct. That is correct. Um, there are people going both through the resettlement agencies and through the sponsor circle program as well. Um, and let's see, do they need to how many total? How many total are expected to come overall in phase two and over how long a period of time? Um, right now, we're expecting several thousand um, and over the next several months. Um, there's not, I think that the, the numbers and the time frame is a little bit in limbo, um, but we are expecting several thousand and we are expecting at least for the next several months um, yep. for people to be coming over from various locations throughout the world. Yeah, and, and, and we know that now people are coming in from both um, from Qatar, from United Arab Emirates, from uh, uh, Albania, and other countries as well. Yes, no, there have been a number of, of locations where people have arrived from. Yeah. Um, and then uh, second last question in the chat is, is Refuge Point involved at all in helping refugees who are here get family members who are at risk out of Afghanistan? Um, I can speak to this to some degree, and Sasha, if you want to also add, um, mm -hmm. we're not we're not we're not involved in any legal uh, specific legal assistance in getting people's families from Afghanistan to the United States. But um, one of the most important steps for any of the uh, folks who have arrived is to access the free legal services that I think both um, Jerry and Eileen have helped Mohammed with. And once Mohammed is able to um, adjust his status, then he will be able to apply to have any fam family members come over from Afghanistan to join him in the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I know that there's some confidential things around people who are um, who are trying to get out of Afghanistan as well. But there's a there's a question here for Mohammed. Mohammed says, "You are awesome. I'm so impressed with how quickly you've been able to pick up and get moving in such a new place. Keep it up. I'm curious to know what your favorite hobby in the U.S. is, and whether it's something uh, new to you here or something that you did before in Afghanistan." My favorite hobby is actually anything that's outdoor. I like it. Mm -hmm. Did did you were you um, doing things outdoors before in Afghanistan a lot? What, do you mean like playing sports or going for walks or what do you mean? Yeah, playing soccer and uh, mostly for walking and uh, 
Yeah, I, I was not at home. I was totally busy, busy with work and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. And so what are the places that you have um, visited so far in the US? Uh, and firstly, I visit Boston, Harvard. <laughs> I toured to Harvard and- Our son is in Boston. So we, we went up to meet our son and his partner. And then we went to Harvard and uh, Mohammed has the picture next to the statue of John Harvard, and John Harvard. Okay. that's where he'll get his MBA. <laughs> oh, good. Let me know the next time you come. I live right next to Cambridge, and okay. Refuge Point's office is in Cambridge. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. We'll next time we're back up to see it. And mm -hmm. and and where else have you gone? Uh, I went to Alexandria in Virginia uh, about two weeks ago, and. A month, a month and a half ago. Uh -huh. There's my uncle, my grandma, and my cousins over there. And I go there to visit them. How are they doing? They're doing well. Good. They are? And, uh, Who is the uh, most important person to see? Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Want to see his grandma. Uh -huh. is, this your, is this your mom's mom or your dad's mom? Yeah, it's my mom's mom. And Your mom's how, mom. many, how many grandchildren does she have? Um, 39. <laughs> 39 grandchildren. And he, he started calculating how many his paternal grandmother has, and he lost count. His, uh -huh. father, his father's one of 10. So, and an average family is six children, right? You said yes. Average Afghan family is six children. So, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure it was really special for you to see her and for her to see you here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And last month I was uh, in Vermont doing a ski. Mm -hmm. And we stopped in uh, Massachusetts to visit Mahir. Yes. And visit Mahir and visit. Uh, he's I think he's watching now our Zoom. Oh, good. Mahir is your cousin. Yeah, Mahir is my cousin and he's in Linux. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And you grew up with Mahir? Yeah. He's my childhood friend. That's great. That's great. I, it's it's really nice to hear that you do have some family here. I think um, one of the incredible challenges that I've seen is um, is the fact that a lot of people have been separated from from their families and are hoping to reunite at some point soon. Um, it's nice that you at least have a few family members here, and I hope that you'll be able to reunite with your parents and family as quickly as possible. He, uh, Muhammad is uh, uh, practicing Ramadan, and at the end of Ramadan, there's a feast Eid, E-I-D, and he'll go back down to Alexandria. It's kind of their Christmas, uh, Muslim mm -hmm. Christmas, so he'll go back down to Alexandria. And then, but I'm amazed at his fortitude of uh, getting up early before sunrise and eating something, and he all day, sunrise to sunset, no water, no drinks, no food. Uh huh. We wait until sunset and then we have dinner. And you break the fast. Break mm -hmm. the fast. Mm -hmm. So the, a, a couple of other questions have come in um, and I, I want to just go to those. One of them is how hard um, was it to find legal support for his um, uh, permanent application process? And I'll just also say that that um, the advocacy community has come together to pressure Congress to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. Um, people, Afghans who arrived here and were evacuated here came on um, a status called humanitarian parole, which enabled them to come in legally very quickly. But that status has to be adjusted within two years and people have to apply for asylum. The Afghan Adjustment Act will just give a blanket waiver to all those 75,000 plus people who came here to adjust their status so that they don't have to um, pursue individual legal claims and apply for asylum here. Our asylum system in many ways is dysfunctional and takes a really long time. <laughs> so we're hoping that the Afghan Adjustment Act will be passed sometime soon. Um, but 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 I have heard with sponsor circles that people do have access to legal services. Were you able to find that well, easily we had or a, is that difficult? No, we had a special contact. We knew somebody at the Yale, uh, one of the clinics in Yale. She is in, works in the veterans clinic, but she knows <laughs> not to help us, but she could uh, 
took all the information. And what's the best part is that all these um, parolees come very well vetted. They're all checked out. And uh, so she's passing that information to the immigration and uh, naturalization clinic. And we hope to go through that. We, we did get a list of, of uh, places you could go for legal aid, but uh, since we knew this in down at Yale, we thought we'd start there. Mm -hmm. And someone else I know, they helped her get a, her citizenship. So come back next month and we'll tell you how well that's working. But it no, is, that's, that's wonderful. And that's what I've seen in a lot of cases with the Sponsor Circle program is that the people who are creating Sponsor Circles do have legal connections and can help. There's another question here um, from my friend Sophie. Nice to see you, Sophie. You're all amazing and inspiring. Thank you for hosting the session. When a Sponsor Circle writes out the plan, how long is that plan for? So I, so I know that that plan is supposed to be at a minimum for three months. But Jerry and Eileen, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Well, we're adopting Mohammed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we're, we're adopting. We, our plan is to get him established. <coughs> and he, however long that takes. He needs a car, he needs to go to school. He needs to get his parents here. We have a wonderful space for him. And he's absolutely delight. And he's... Uh, cooking and cleaning up and doing all those wonderful things so yeah we'll wait until we're in it for the long haul yeah. mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. to get we'd love to get him get rid of him soon but uh, <laughs> that's not gonna happen <laughs> muhammad do you get jerry's jokes he's a little sarcastic yes. but you seem to always smile when he says sarcastic things yes. yeah just... uh, and one of the hardest things to do in any other language is humor and he does humor very well. He gets our humor. He gets ours and we get his. Yeah. So we should say something like, we'll keep you until you stop winning at Rummy Cube and let somebody <laughs> else at the table win at Rummy Cube. He's just fantastic at it. He just sees all these combinations, whatever. Uh, wow. Part of his mathematical brain, brain I think. Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're getting uh, wonderful comments about you, Jerry and Eileen, how, 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 what wonderful host you are. And Muhammad, to you, Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs> Happy uh -huh. Ramadan. Yeah. Um, and, and I also, there, there's another comment here. It's actually from um, somebody named Deng Aguer in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, which is a place that I've spent a lot of time in the past saying that, um, that Many people here went to school, have skills, want to work, um, and we don't have hope for life. And I just want to highlight, thank you for putting that in, Deng. You know, with these, with these Zoom calls, it's like we are so connected virtually that we can show up here and Mohammed, you can, your parents can see you here, even though they're in Kabul and people can tune in from around the world. And at the same time, we are so far apart in so many ways, legal barriers, the circumstances as people who've had to flee their homes and are refugees keep us separate. And a lot of people um, like Deng are in places that they don't wanna be and, and, and wanna get out and wanna find some kind of pathway to normalcy in their lives. And, that, and so I just wanna recognize that. There's, there's no really good answer around that. These virtual forums are places where these, both the connections that we have and the divides that exist in the world come um, into sharper focus. But I do wanna say that Refuge Point is dedicated as an organization to advancing solutions for refugees identifying people who need to resettle to other countries um, and helping to train other organizations to do that and helping to work with governments so that more people can have access to safety so that they're not stuck forever in dead end situations. And this is what we've dedicated our whole organization to. And we've grown a lot in, in, in that respect. We're able now to build the Sponsor Circle program. We have launched a labor mobility pilot project with the Canadian government. We have built a family reunion effort with the UN Refugee Agency and another well-known organization called the International Refugee Assistance Project. These are all other pathways that we are trying to build and forge in the world so more people can reunite with family and have access and a path to a better life, to a dignified life, to a place where they can rebuild and feel um, a sense of normalcy and dignity. So I just wanted to say that. And as, as we come to the final um, 
last couple of minutes. Mohammed, is there anything else that you would like to share with anybody? Um, in the end, I just want to uh, thanks to Eileen and Jerry that uh, I'm grateful for their support and uh, thanks for helping me to accomplish my goal. And uh, uh, thank you uh, for being a great example of leadership to me. Thank you. Thank you. It is a delight to have you with us. I I think that is the perfect place to bring a close to this Voices from the Field session. Thank you everybody for joining Refuge Point today. It's been a real pleasure to see you in the chat, to have you join us at this really critical moment in history when more people are displaced than ever before. And we have to figure out ways to open up our homes and hearts so more people have access to safety and a new life. And we're really grateful that you joined us today. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.